Excellent, excellent. Um, do you mind if I record this so that if there's anybody else that wants to uh, collaborate on this, we can uh, invite them to watch it? We publish, like, yeah. we publish all our stuff online. So, okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Um, excellent, excellent. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for offering to do this. This is pretty cool. Uh, as far as the... How, what are you thinking about this? So as far as the quote that you provided, would that be the, the firm quote or, or that's a guess and then we'd have to negotiate from there? I'm pretty confident that uh, I, I can do it at that price. And I mean, I'm not making, I'm really not making any money at all, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to start doing more commercial stuff with my equipment to kind of support my hobby. And uh, um, so if I can get a couple of deals like this through that, you know, demonstrate that I can actually deliver. I'm, I'm happy with that. Yeah. Uh, Where are you counting your time time as like 25 bucks or something per hour or less? Or um, I basically I sourced materials, did an estimate of how long it would take me to do it, um, and then I talked with a, a friend of mine who's a machinist out in Fulton and asked him how to price it from there, and he said, you know, yeah. You know, the numbers that I've got added on to it, he said, the, the big, like I explained in the earlier email, the problem with this is that you're, 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 you're too small in terms of volume for a, a full uh, automated run and big for a manual run. So okay. it's right in that spot that either somebody's gonna be spending a lot of manual time doing it, or somebody's gonna spend a lot of time setting up to do an automated run and you, you don't have enough parts to get back the economy of scale. Yeah. So kind of which way you want to go. Um, you know, for me, I, I can set up and I can run these and and like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not making any money on it, but it'll cover my time. Uh, do you have a figure for the time? Like what are you accounting for your time? Do you have a number on yeah, that? Like I'm just putting it all into into a per unit cost, okay. per unit price. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's take a look at the FreeCAD file, just so that okay. as far as what I sent to you and the word explanation, I mean, the, the explanation, I mean, was that clear? Can you picture the thing uh, pretty clearly in your mind or? Well, from uh, unless I'm completely misunderstanding, we're just we're talking about basically a block with three holes in it, and you, I, I see that you drew an origin point off of a corner right. of the block. Right. But from what I could gather, looking at it, the critical dimensions are the relationship of the holes to each other. They are, um, but that the left corner, if you can picture that also has a tolerance of like plus minus one millimeter or so like you can't because there's some other part let's take a look at where this fits let's take a look at let me send you the link of um so we can so this would be the universal uh let me share my screen with you here so sure that um Where's this present? Okay, so that's D3D Universal here. Um, so the CAD is here. Um, okay, so the extruder is here. So what we're talking about is an extruder. Okay, that doesn't show it. Let's just download the file of the extruder assembly. Uh, can I ask you about free? So this is FreeCAD 17. In FreeCAD 16, can does FreeCAD 19 still allow you to do the very simple thing with body without the body op part object? Yes, I believe you can do that. Although there's a lot of advantages to switching over to. Well, first to using bodies, but then especially using uh, using parts. Um, the stuff that Real Thunder has added with the uh, um, uh, part link uh, is is fantastic. It's uh, it allows us to do assemblies and uh, and especially be able to link between um, different FreeCAD documents. 
So you can partially open, you could have one document that's an assembly and it references other documents that contain the individual parts. And it will handle partial loading of those other documents and jumping between them and clones and it's just, it's really awesome. Uh, and that workflow came out in which FreeCAD version? At the 19. The 19, hmm. Uh, cause we'll and the, other, the other thing in 19 that is, I think, relevant for your purposes is uh, TechDraw has been oh, yeah. greatly expanded. Uh, there's so much more in TechDraw, not to mention all the stuff that's in Path. So I saw that you were using the old uh, 16 yeah. templates for yeah, yeah. drawing. It's just so much better now with actual uh, tolerance uh, on dimensions and uh, yeah. better templates. Well, marks, you name it. Oh, okay, okay. Is uh, is the path workbench now capable of getting you like? So, say I want to do. Um, let's see. What would we use it for? Path would. Say I have. What's the best use case? Uh, say we have. CNC cut steel, just lines. Would that be an appropriate thing, or is it more for routing? Like, can it get you the toolpath for for a CNC to, uh, torch path easily? Or sure, yeah. I mean, the uh, path is wants to do. Well, I'll tell you the things it's not very well set up to do right now. Um, surfacing uh, for actual three D, you know, uh, three axis true surfacing is coming. We have a little bit of that, but it's still pretty weak. Um, for if you're doing pure 2D, where your 2D models uh, or your 3D models contain 2D information. So, for instance, um, we had a, a guy that wanted to do sail cutting, and he wanted to uh, have a 2D model that, or a 3D model, very thin 3D model that represents the sail to be cut. And there's lines that basically the shape represents where to profile it and the internal holes to cut. But then he wanted marking information like where to fold or um, you know, to uh, use a, a pen to mark part numbers and so forth, where you've got 2D information on a 3D surface. That is, that's not supported yet, but it's something I'm working on now. So you're actually developing that part? So you're the lead developer? Yeah, I, I, lead, I lead the development on Pathwork Edge. Oh, OK. Is Yorick involved in that? Yeah, York is, uh, he doesn't do much of the development anymore. Um, Dan Falk and I contracted with York to write the C++ core of Path back six, seven years ago. And then I've done uh, the, well, I started all the development and now I coordinate. I don't do much of the hands-on development anymore. I'm mostly coordinating the other, other developers. Uh-huh. What's, um, what depth of skill set do they have to have? Is, does it go into C or is it Python? Mostly Python. Uh, the C++ is focused on sort of the deeper algorithms for uh, surfacing and offsetting. Um, but, you know, that's why I say we haven't done much with 3D, uh, you know, where you're working with true 3D models and surfacing because we don't have an open source uh, library that uh, has real strong algorithms there. We've been using uh, an, an implementation of Clipper, which is actually very strong for 2D offsetting. Um, and that's, that's all, the, the C++ of that is largely finished. And then all the UI um, is all Python and Qt. Uh, Clipper, how do I find Clipper, Clipper, when I Google it? Uh, search for Clipper and Angus Johnson. So that's a, Angus Johnson wrote this library many, many years ago. Uh, it's the offsetting library that was used in Heek CNC. Um, it's mm. used internally in a whole bunch of, of uh, 3D printing slicing algorithms. I think Slicer may be based on it. Mm. And there's been a lot of different implementations of it. Uh, we started with the implementation from Heek CNC and then effectively rewrote that uh, and have our own implementation now. But it's effectively the same algorithm. I see. Hmm. 
so the missing link is for 3D, there's nothing out there. And, and how difficult is it to, to create an algorithm like that? Very. The, uh, the, the, we, there's two, there's a library that we have that's called OpenCamLib, written by Anders uh, Wallen. Um, and it is, it, it does uh, some pretty decent surfacing. It's not very fast. But it'll do, that's what we're doing for surfacing right now. Um, we managed to convince Anders to relicense that as uh, LGPL so it could be included with uh, FreeCAD. And it'll do a drop cutter and a water lining um, operation or algorithm. Um, if you want to get beyond that and you want to get into really efficient stuff, there's there, even the commercial companies are using a handful of uh, tools. Uh, I think Autodesk purchased uh, FreeSteel um, or HSM Works, which was written by the guys that uh, from FreeSteel, uh, Julian Todd and I forget his partner's name. Um, but there's only a handful of people in the world that are actually capable of writing those those kinds of algorithms to be. Uh, both effective for machining and fast. And the difficulty of um, coming up with it, like if you were to explain it, can you explain why that's so difficult? Because you, you can think, oh, like the kind of algorithms that are involved, what makes it so difficult? Uh, the math. Um, the uh, If you think about like how uh, OpenCamLib works, it supports about four different tool shapes. It'll support a cylinder, so an end mill. It'll mm -hmm. support a ball end mill, a toroidal cutter, and a V cutter. And it basically takes that tool and generates a, a bag of triangles. And then takes your model and tessellates that to a bag of triangles. And then pushes them together to find out where they collide from coming from a direction and then generates a whole list of points from that and interpolates to come up with a tool path. And it's, like I say, it's <laughs> just pro just the 3D, the, the math behind the 3D stuff is pretty daunting, well beyond me. Um, but beyond that, being able to process an enormous number of triangles, uh, looking for collisions like that in an efficient way, it should be doable in a GPU, but nobody's done it in a GPU yet. So it's, it's just, uh, there's just aren't enough people, especially in the open source world, working on it. But do, do the commercial guys, like you say, like AutoCAD, they have? AutoCAD has, uh, you know, there's a number of commercial CAM applications out there. Um, as far as I know, nobody's done that in a GPU yet. They're, they're all relying on traditional CPU processing, and they're all relatively slow. Uh, to to get the toolpath out? Like how long does it take to, to generate one? For some Depends on the complexity of the model. Like say you wanted to mill like a three-dimensional face on say a flat, say out of wood. It'll depend on the size of the tool, uh, how much step over you got, how much tool engagement, um, the, uh, the detail, how many triangles in the model. Uh, but some of those tool paths will processing will run for you know hours. Yeah, yeah. But I think a lot of the stuff, like for example, if we talk about simple job like doing the the heat sink and various kinds of mach uh, screw machine type operations, how to go about that? That's kind of like you got to pro program it manually. Well, like like your part here. Uh, we can do all of that using the uh, uh, the operations that we've got now, okay. because we, we're dealing with flat surfaces, yeah. and uh, you know, so I can I can slice that model into layers and then use the layers uh, to be offsetting to figure out where the toolpath has got to be. I can pocket out to you know to do like a milling uh, operation on a top face or a lower face. Um, I can detect where circles are so I can figure out how to do drilling. Um, you know, those kinds of, and, and for probably 80 to 90% of the CNC work that goes on in the world today, yeah, yeah. that kind of 2.5D machining is fine, works great. Right. 
Two point, yeah, yeah, that's right. And and the path module supports two point five fully. Yes. Okay, so yeah, we're pretty good. We're pretty good on that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, as far as the documentation of the path module, is that relatively well done, or is it pretty spotty right now, or? Um, guys have been working pretty heavily on the uh, um, the on the wiki, getting ready for the zero dot nineteen release. Um, I don't, you know, I would have said three months ago that we were a month away from release on nineteen, and then COVID hit, mm -hmm. and um, and and it's had strange effects. Uh, I think a lot of developers ended up with free time, and people started contributing a lot. And for one reason or another, Yorick and Werner chose not to release. And so we're, there's just been a lot of development going on lately, um, but we have not announced a release schedule yet for 19. I see, I see. As far as the, the governance of FreeCAD altogether, so basically Yorick and Werner, they, they basically call the shots, or how does it work? Um, Ultimately, I would consider Werner like a, a chief technology officer, and no release is going to happen until Werner says it's time. Um, for version 18, he set out some very specific criteria. He wanted to see us on Python 3 and QT5 support, and when we hit both of those, basically we announced a release and went forward. 19 was all about integrating and stabilizing Real Thunder's uh, app link stuff, which has been in now for quite a while. I consider 19 more stable than 18 um, for most things. There, there's always some work going on. Uh, but, you know, for whatever reason, your, or Werner has not, not said, you know, what the final criteria is going to be for a release. So we're kind of still, still developing. I see. Do, at current, like, like when I'm on 16 still, like, or actually 17 and 18, I keep getting crashes on exploded part animations. Is that still a persistent problem uh, anywhere? Or? Uh, what kind of animations? In the exploded part animation workbench. Uh, I'm not familiar with that workbench. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, where you explode. It's what? Is that an add on workbench? Yeah. Add-on workbench, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I was wondering, yeah, no, because we—it's really useful, like exploding the the object for explanation purposes. But it just keeps crashing on me all the time. I don't don't know what to do. But anyway, um, okay. So um, yeah, uh, take a look at my screen here. So um, okay. So let me see if I can just explain. So so, so I mean. That's the block that you see. There's an artifact there that's just messing, just just an artifact. Um, but basically, like I think the most important thing is to, like when you're doing this, to have a feel for how. Because I I don't think I think you can mess it up if this hole like is forward here instead of backwards. So right. what you have to note is that that hole is closer to the back than to the front. Did you pick that up? The, uh, um, yes, I did. I saw that on the drawing. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah that, the dimensions on that are clear. Okay, okay. So if you, and, and you can picture, so you recognize this as an extruder, right? Or? Yep. Okay. Um, so yeah, if the, it basically has to fit like this into this, all this other stuff is pretty much 3D printed outside the stepper motor and a couple of things. Uh, the space here, yeah, there's a little bit of space there too, so yeah, you don't have so much problem there. Here, that there's nothing there, so that tolerance there doesn't matter. But as long as you're clear on, I think the main thing I wanted to make sure is that you know that that hole is towards the back, not towards the front. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. And beyond that, that's about it. Now, is it possible, like? Can you, after you do the first one, before you go into everything, can you like maybe send that to me or that's not possible because of the workflow? What's, What's your, your time, time frame? Um, time frame is six weeks. Okay. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I can, well, yes, I can. The, uh, the thing is, with, with a part like this, making one is no big deal. The trick is, you know, how, how do you make, because, you know, just looking at it, there's actually not a lot of, of CNC work in here. Because uh, the block is going to be cut from from stock uh, to length, so that could be a, you know, a bandsaw or a chop saw operation much faster than a CNC in, in wasting less material. And then you know you need a digital readout to position the holes correctly. So there's you need to locate off of an end and then position the holes and drill them drill them straight. Um, but everything else is yeah you know you're, you're it, it, there's just not much CNC in there. Right. So, for me, I'm looking at this and, and saying, okay, if I can, if I instead of making one, if I can set it up uh, where I'm cutting the stock to, you know, say 26 inches long, and I'm facing one end of the stock, and then and locating off of that, and then I'm cutting, you know, I'm, I'm drilling all the holes. Doing a tool, or you know, center drilling all the holes, tool change, drilling all the holes. Uh, you know, you got to move the stock to the second setup, locate again, center drill for the the uh, critical threaded hole, um, tool change, drill the hole, tool change, um, and then uh, you know, chamfer if we're going to put a chamfer on it. And then I take it out, and I've, I've also, during that CNC, I've also engraved the cut line between the parts. So then it comes off, goes on to a bandsaw again, and I know exactly where to cut. Since the ends of that part, those dimensions aren't critical. I mean, I've already got the, the orientation of the holes relative to each other, and the critical hole to the back wall already established. The ends of the block can be within half a millimeter, and it'll be fine. So then, you know, that way what I've done is I've minimized the number of tool changes that I have to go through on the mill, um, you know, per part. I'm only tool changing every six parts or so. You said you're working on a 26 inch piece of stock? Uh, or something like that, or 24 inch. So something I'd, like 12, I'd, I'd, 12 pieces at a time? I'd figure out the, the, the largest number of pieces that I can work um, at one time, and then I'd cut the stock to do that. And I'll have to measure because I have to get to the ends of it and everything on my mill, and I have to burn a little material for clamping. So I'll have to I'll have to work out exactly how much I can do. Whether that works out to five parts or six, I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. Yep. Um, is it? Would it ever have been preferable to take a flat half-inch thick piece of stock? And just do that all by cutting out the blocks with the mill, or no? That doesn't make sense. Well, I mean, I, you know, the fastest the, the fastest operation you can do in the shop is going to be with a saw. So you know, I can remove more material with a saw than I can with any other tool. So you know, breaking that that long stick of stock into a hundred two-inch pieces is pretty efficient. But now, if I clamp one of those into the vise, and I go to, to do the operation, I now have to change tools, whatever, four times, and I have to reposition twice to finish one part. So now I've got, you know, whatever, five manual operations times 100 parts. It's just going to be, you know, I'm going to spend all my time yeah. screwing the drawbar in and out. Yeah. Yep. So I need to minimize tool changes to make it at all efficient. Okay. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. Um, do you? What, what do you do for a living? Is is this? Uh, you do machining work for a living, or what? What do you do for a living? I'm I'm a developer and an entrepreneur. I've got a couple of different uh, businesses that I'm involved with. Um, I got involved in open source development probably. Geez, I don't know. 14, 15 years ago. Um, I wrote a book about FreeCAD. I kind of oversee the, the path development. Um, and now I'm starting to do more small scale manufacturing, but mostly it's that's for that's for testing what I'm doing with path more than anything else. I have a strong desire 
to steer the path development so that FreeCAD is actually competitive for at least 2.5D commercial manufacturing. Um, yeah. When we get to 3 great, but like I said, 80 to 90 percent of the work today, FreeCAD can do just fine. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, it, it, if I feel like if, if we can make path work for commercial interests, it'll oh, be a yeah. better tool for hobbyists and and open source guys as well. Absolutely. What would be the budget if somebody had to develop a three-dimensional uh, capacity in there? Like, is it like a year of programming with the guy who knows the math, or? Oh, I, w I would say I'm not the one to, the, to ask. The uh, um, I, I would say it's it, it's significant. It's uh, like I said, there's there's very few people who have the the programming and the math chops to do that, and even fewer who have access to machine tools for testing. Um, Julian Todd is the one guy that I know that could, you know, and he's actually working with us. Um, he, he's free steel. Um, uh -huh. uh, he's a Brit. He got, he sold his company to Autodesk, was pretty bitter about it, uh, and would really like to see, you know, an open source tool that competes. But he is a, um, he's an interesting character, and he is not, uh, so far has not, you know, he's got interest in doing some things, but I have not found him to actually be producing code. So, and he, I don't think he's wanting for the money, so I don't think he could be bought. Uh, so he's just not interested in en enough right now, or like, what do you think the, I mean, does he, is he busy with other things, or? Yeah, he's uh, he's interested in other things. He's uh, um, oh geez, he's got his fingers in a whole bunch of very interesting projects. Uh, he offices out of a maker space in Liverpool. Um, I met him at Fosdem in February, uh, and and he's he's just a really really interesting guy. Um, he's you know I, I have high hopes that that if his interest gets there. Uh, he might start developing, I think he's got interest in working on the GPU approach because he's frustrated that commercial interests haven't done that. Uh, they've, uh, um, but, you know, like I said, you, it's open source, so you got, you got to have a developer who has an itch enough to, to want scratching. Yeah. So he made his money by selling the, that capacity to, to Autodesk? Is that? Yeah. That's my understanding. Yeah. But but he's um he's a pretty open source Libre guy or Oh yeah. But this thing for Autodesk, I mean he just did that proprietary that was fully proprietary, right? Or or they bought him out well, it was open source before or No, he um I don't know all the history. He bought he and uh his business partner had written an initial implementation uh, of HSM works called uh, libactp, um, and then and it was released in GPL three, and then pulled back, um, and and there was actually a version of it that w it was in the uh, like the, uh, what is it um, it was in one of the open source uh, attics someplace. You can still find it. Libactp is still out there. It's not usable. It's not functional. Uh, Libactp. Yeah, that's for adaptive something toolpath. Libactp. Uh, adaptive clearing. Yeah, adaptive that's it. Adaptive clearing toolpath. And, and you you can dig into that and and you know you'll see a lot of the math that's going on and between that and the Free Steel blog, if you look at the machining part, you'll you'll get a sense for what you know. What, what's going into these algorithms? Um, but I've talked with Julian about libactp, saying, "Well, you know, can it be dusted off and made to work?" And he said, "No, it's not." Um, the uh, uh, he has, you know, he he would like to rewrite some of this stuff specific with an initial implementation in Python, knowing that it'll be slow, but. You know his his idea is you write for Python because it's very approachable. A lot of people can can 
get at it. And then when you get the algorithm right, you rewrite the core parts of it in C or C++ uh -huh. or whatever for speed. And uh, uh, But he wants to write the implementation to be executed on a GPU mm -hmm. so that it massively parallel um, and you know very, very fast. And who is who is Jel Faringa? Yeah. Is that another guy? Pardon me. Uh, this guy here, Jel Faringa, is that? Oh, th on. Okay, that's where the libactp lives right now. No, nah, he's forked it. Okay. He's the, the. I don't know where he forked it from, but he he's he forked it from some. There's a there's a bunch of versions of it out there. Uh huh. I see. And then, sorry, name of the free, st free steel guy, what's his name? His name's Julian, Julian Todd. Julian Todd, okay. Okay. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. But given that, yeah, I mean, you can still do like 80 90 percent of all this stuff so i guess that's probably why there's not a super itch for a lot of people right probably or uh, honestly especially i mean you know freecad and path have found uh, a real following in the diy maker community and the tools that those guys have access to are 2d 2.5d machines they got plasma cutters and cnc routers and you know, shape ocos and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the amount of actual surfacing that you need. Every once in a while, I get a guy that's trying to make a guitar, or um, you know, you know, whatever he wants to carve a, a a face or something like that. But most of the stuff is, you know, it, it's drilling and profiling and pocketing and 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 two point five D work. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's. You know, it, it's made sense for us to focus on that stuff. In fact, with everything going on, I ran into my first um, first project within the last two or three weeks that actually required me to do a surfacing operation. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I've been running the code for eight years, but I've never honestly needed a surfacing operation until a week ago. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see? Where do you see FreeCAD evolving to? I mean, are you seeing that as being competitive with SolidWorks and other things, or you you see oh, it yeah, as a notch? Um, the FreeCAD is, um, I mean, the, the the competition with Fusion and Autodesk has been fierce because they're giving it away to hobbyists and to education and to even to small scale commercial. It's it's free. So it's, it's pretty hard to compete with that. But FreeCAD has gotten stronger and stronger, especially in Europe, because the trade schools are teaching it. And trade the, schools are teaching it, really? Yeah, there's a, there's a number of uh, trade schools in Europe that are, um, that, that's their teaching program for CNC is, okay. is based on FreeCAD, because they don't want to be beholden to a commercial, uh, they don't want their students tied to a commercial product. Wow. Um, so. Huh. It, it, we've made inroads there, but the other part is that FreeCAD's fully scriptable. Um, so, you know, write your own workbench, write a macro, run it headless on a server. Um, you know, now you can do things with it that are, you know, if you're building your business process to be integrated to the web, the last thing you want is to be 100% tied to a commercial company that can pull the rug out from under you. So. FreeCAD is it works well in a in a headless environment and and that being open source software is is uh, you know you've got the source. Yeah, the thing that does it for I mean to me it's like if somebody asks me if, which is better I say clearly FreeCAD. I mean for us it's very simple. We did we make our own workbenches for all the machines that we start to make. Can't do it right. anywhere else. So yeah, yeah, like we just did the 3D printer workbench in FreeCAD. So that's awesome, and you can't even dream of that in other packages because you don't have the code. Yeah. Well, um, I'm not sure if you're aware of the project, um, but uh, take a look at. Let's see if I can find a URL. Um, 
It's just your dot parts. Yeah. Um, Have you I, seen this? I haven't. What is that about? So this is a, a project by one of the developers, a guy named uh, Jean-Marie Verdun. Um, he's a French guy. But he lives here in the United States. Uh huh. Uh, this is scroll down. Oh no! And then way, click, uh, click on one of those, like that uh, idler wheel on the second row at the far right. Oh wow! This is FreeCAD. This is backed up by FreeCAD. Oh my goodness! And you can you from within FreeCAD you execute a couple lines of code and it'll push your model up to his server. Um, and you and he's now open sourced the whole project so you oh. can run your own. Server. Oh no way! That's this is awesome. And the, the the goal here is to be linking these models together through the part link. So you could be looking at this idler wheel, but then navigate up to an assembly where it's used, yeah. or drill from assembly down mm. to an individual part. Huh. Let's see. On this site, what's his product here on the site? This is this is his reference implementation for how the the, the server side works. Um, so if you create an account, you'll be able to push models up to it. And uh, um, and then you can you can make your models public and you know this is all pretty new stuff. Um, but he's he's actively working this project. He has a background. Um, he did development for Facebook or for a Facebook uh, contractor. So this thing is designed to scale massively. Uh, it's very very robust. Um, Anyway, it's a neat project, and for what you guys are doing, it might be something that's worth looking at. Is uh, is is the code open source too for the the back end or? Yes. Wow. This is awesome. Uh, he's in the United States. Yeah, he's in. Uh, I think he's in Florida right now. Oh my goodness, this is awesome. <laughs> See, this is why. Uh, I mean, this is because of FreeCAD, right? This this does not happen with other packages. That's right. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, he had uh, he had some sort of a relationship with the open open hardware initiative, open hardware. I forget the group. You talking about um, open so source that, hardware association? Yeah. So that that model that you're seeing that uh, that's on the splash screen was a uh, some piece of computing hardware that was designed by the open hardware organization, and then he represented it in. You know, like you can navigate that model in in his tool in here. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, you talked to him before, or you know the guy, or yeah, yeah, we've all time. Yeah, there's a there's a Gitter. Uh, Precat has a a Gitter page. I can send you a link. Um, and he's on. He's got his own channel on there uh, for this project. And but he's also in the, the path group and the free CAD group. Wow. Uh, what is Gitter, actually? Gitter's like a like a Slack or Discord, okay. uh, but it's it's built around uh, Git projects. So uh, let's see okay. if I can find a. I see. So if you go to gitter.im slash freecad. So yeah, there's a so the path channel, all the path developers are there. The free CAD is the the general one, um, and then and you can log into this with a GitHub account, and then uh, uh, and he has his own channel. You mean GitLab? Uh, see if I can find his channel. GitLab account or GitHub account? GitHub account. GitLab. Uh, back up one page and uh, go to the sign in or sign up on the right. Um, should let you sign in with GitHub. Hey, sign in at the bottom.
Yeah, so it does GitLab or GitHub. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, I'll do that. And let's see, I'm trying to find... Uh, uh, awesome. That's where you guys uh, basically communicate on the development? The uh, Well, we're all over the map. Most of the development talk probably happens on the forum. Uh, Gitter is nice because it's, it's synchronous. So, you know, it's like IRC. Uh, so there's usually people chatting out there, um, and there's there's an IRC channel as well, and you know I don't know the forum has gotten almost unmanageable now. It's so so busy. Mm -hmm. um, and the just your dot parts. Uh, so the code he he released all the code for the. For this functionality, right? That's my understanding. Is one hundred percent of it is open source now. So he's a uh, open source minded guy, of course. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Nice. Yeah, this is great. Because uh, we were looking for a way. We want to embed stuff on the wiki. So is this? I mean, is this actually usable right now? Is he? Is is the model like what? Like, is it paid or free or? Right now, it is it's free. I think he's paying out of pocket to keep his server up, and is looking for a business model to make it sustainable. Um, I've been working with him, at least kind of, you know, giving him advice on on direction of development, and I suggested that he make those three D views uh, embeddable. So the idea is that you can yeah. take that three D model and embed it directly into a forum discussion on FreeCAD. And uh, and everybody could you know you'd have access to that 3D panelable zoomable model, uh, and I think that's done now. So you you'd be able to embed models into your wiki the same way. Oh wow, that is awesome. Yep, yep. Definitely want to follow up with them. Um... So I just I sent you a link uh, to another Gitter page that it's uh, CAD Cloud. I think it's free CAD Cloud, something like that. It's in your inbox. Um, but that's where he's at, and uh, uh, you know he, he's he's very responsive, good guy. Nice. That is awesome. Big money is his handle. That's the guy. Yeah, that's Jean Marie Verdun. Nice. Um, so, you also working on? Um, you mentioned about the EDM machine. So that's something that that's a closed source project, though. It's it's not really closed source. I mean, the guy he he self published a book. Um, the book's been out for fifteen years. He wrote a second book on a, on a pulse EDM. Um, and I think he he sells a few of these, and he sells the PCBs. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not, you know, he, I, as far as I know, he's not an open source guy. I don't even know that he, you know, gets open source. Um, but yeah, I, I've got a, an idea for a project that needed one of these things. So I've been building one um, for which I hope it, operational in a couple of weeks, but it's mostly a screw around project. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that for a client or is that for you? It's uh, it's for one of the business ideas that I'm I'm working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what's your thought on uh, you know just in general? Like, do you think a lot about where open source is going and the fact how well like the three D printer revolution, like the the promise of everybody making their things that hasn't really materialized yet? Do you have some opinions on that or? Um. I think that, that open source is, it's relentless, but it's not fast. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, we, we have people showing up, you know, going, you know, wow, if we just had this, it would be, you know, it'd be better than the commercial stuff. And it's like, okay, you know, work on it. And 
and you know maybe we'll get there, but we're not going to get there fast. Uh, it takes forever for the you know user interfaces are always lagging, um, but once you have an open source solution to a problem, it's just relentless. It just gets better and better and better. And if somebody stops working on it, you know, maybe it sits for a while and maybe somebody else steps in and picks it up. But it just never dies. It just, it, it can go to sleep for a long time, but it, it never dies. <laughs> yeah. So sooner or later, you know, we'll get there. It's just, you know, from what I've seen, you know, it, it so far, there's been very few projects that have made the jump to commercial support. Uh, that will happen. Uh, at some point, the, the, the open source solution gets good enough that industry can start using it. And they're willing to use it, and they're willing to support the development of it. But you have to have a, a professional enough organization around that to coordinate development and get the money to the right place and you know keep things up and stable um, and, and uh, you know the, it's a chicken and egg the project has to be mature enough to attract that commercial interest but it has a hard time maturing without the commercial interest yeah. so you know it, it'll get there it just takes a long long time yeah uh, so the other thing that we're looking at, um, yeah, because the idea of products turning into enterprise, that's that's a definite challenge of the open source method that it just takes forever. And there's not a good example of a business model coming out rapidly. Like RepRap has done it, but nobody noticed. It maybe took, took a bit of time. Uh, we're looking at doing something like, so right now the idea is, um, organize what we call it would be called extreme enterprise get 200 to a thousand people for a weekend to actually develop a business around something so it's like a startup camp um, so we're looking at here's an electric motor so a 3d printed open source electric motor design that's that's good and you have to figure out a product around it but get enough eyeballs around that in a short period of time and enough disciplines including enterprise development and distribution that it turns into a real product over a weekend something that would take a year or two to do and we're, we can do that in a weekend we're looking at an experiment like that um, have you ever thought of, of of how to accelerate the development rates of various projects like in a rapid way in an unprecedented I, way I thought about that extensively for the last couple of years and um, you know I, I mean I led a, uh, a, a group of, uh, of kids uh, in an it so that the University of Missouri uh, in Columbia the uh, uh, incubator the Missouri Innovation Center was the sponsoring organization for the first uh, explorer post in the country focused on entrepreneurship and uh, uh, engineering. So these are, are kids 15 to 21 years old that are mm -hmm. self-described inventors. They want to develop products and they want to be entrepreneurial. And I was coaching that group and we you know, looked extensively at how do you take ideas and then move them forward. And the problem is, is that it, it's just you know, the, the initial idea happens fast and then success at some point kind of happens fast and in between that is this grind of iteration yep and you know it's, it's not about making this part it's about figuring out how to make this part efficiently and and that's hard work it's just it, you just it just have to grind on it yeah. so I, I haven't you know, there's I can do so much with with FreeCAD Path, but if I want to take, you know, it, here's a model, and I need to do 20 operations, and I need them to happen in a particular order, and I need a surface finish, and it, and then I, now I have to do that over and over and over again, because step 16 had a problem, and step 17 had a problem, and it's 
you're just grinding until you get uh, you get it to work. Yeah. And that's not just the, the physical manufacturing part. It's even worse when you're talking about the marketing and the the communication and the intellectual property and the, everything else. It's that middle part doesn't happen fast. Yeah. If you find a way to do that fast, you know, awesome. But it's a um, it's it's a rough road. Yeah. No. Undoubtedly, it's true. And. Um... If there were, would you see a way that that could happen if you have unlimited resources, or does this get into Brooks' law? You know Brooks' law? Brooks law. Brooks' law is the more people you throw at a project, the later it gets. I I would say that there that aspect of it is there, but it, it's. Part of it is also just that that you know, things take time. Um, maybe with unlimited resources, you can um, you can move faster. But I I think it's it's not because you can do the traditional things faster with um, with unlimited resources. It's that with unlimited resources, you can you don't have to do a lot of the traditional things. You know, if if I've got unlimited resources, then I can buy a CNC machine with a automatic bar feeder and a robotic pallet loader, and you know, and I can do all of these things that don't require a human being, you know, to iterate through. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, Elon Musk has figured out how to move faster on some things, but he's still blowing up rockets too. So yeah, yeah. Hmm. Have you thought? Have you ever thought of a, of an incentive challenge like events to test some of these ideas? Or there's a I participate every year in a startup weekend, which is like an it's a 48 hour entrepreneurial boot start. Yep. Or boot wrap thing. In in and Colombia. In Colombia, they they're on nationwide though. It's a actually it's an international organization now. And some really good ideas have come out of that. Uh, Equipment Share is a local company that's now global. Um, Zapier started here. Uh, but those are the exceptions. Far and away, most of these things fail miserably. Um, you just, you know, like I say, the ones that work, actually somebody came in with a good idea and had worked out a lot of the, the complexity ahead of time and they made it look like it happened in a weekend, but it really didn't. It, it, there was a lot of work that went in ahead of time. Yeah, I, but I think it's um, making that happen is, yeah, like getting a project at a particular rate of maturity or that there's enough prior art done, then that, that, yeah, exactly, it's this illusion that you think it happened over that weekend, uh, right. but you selected it right and it just all came together because there was a lot of, lot of prior art there. Yeah. Um, would a would a thing like um, do you have any interest in electric motors? Yeah, sure. Would you participate if we um, so if we have an event where we are crafting a careful collaboration architecture of between two hundred and a thousand people to meet over a weekend? Would you be one of those people? Maybe it would depend on the timing and cost and things like that, but maybe. If it were right now, we're gonna look at doing it remote. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, we're, we're gonna look in, into that, doing it remote. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. What what kind of thing would you want to be doing with a? Explain the motor aspect. So, the three D printed electric motor would be something that's actually there's two sides to it. One is is an education kit for how you build, basically training you how to do axial flux electric motors. But the other part is taking that into hopefully with 3D printing methods, but if not, going into more standard metal, but basically developing a, an open source scalable modular electric motor that's high performance. So on one side you've got the education component, like basically a STEM kit. On the other side, okay, this is actually a motor that you can build and it's inexpensive, it's better, faster, stronger, it's open source, by virtue of paying a lot of <laughs> due diligence to all the time you know, to all the things that take the development time. 
But I think something is something that's very modular and scalable that can apply to home appliances up to like electric cars. I think that's doable. Um, so I think it's a good idea to have an open source electric motor that would be then lower cost. But I think the bigger part of that too is, I mean, I guess the lo for me it's the localized production aspect and um, the idea that you can build it, you understand it, you can maintain it forever. So it's basically it becomes an appropriate technology item as opposed to mm -hmm. something you have to throw out. Yeah. Probably outside my skill set. The uh, um, I mean, I have an interest in stuff like that, but it's uh, you know I, I'm not trained as an engineer, so I'm uh, I'm probably probably the, the wrong guy to do that. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, like uh, the way we're thinking about it, though, is that one side is the technical development, but we'll we'll br be bringing in everything else. Like here's the enterprise aspect and everything else. So we ha I think by combining so many different. Uh, rolls in one. It's kind of like the startup camp thing, uh, trying to attract people that way. That you you'll be um, you'll see a lot of things happening in a short time because there's so many different areas of people. So it's actually like it's not just for t technical people. It's it's everything else around that too. Gotcha. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You probably well, you'll probably hear about it uh, more later. But uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just ide just basically in ideating this because to me the biggest single missing piece is the the aspect of enterprises coming out and you mentioned the reason yeah that takes a lot of time but I think you know just like with the principle of okay given enough eyeballs any problem is shallow kind of deal seems that we could if we have the organizational structure to handle such a such an effort I think we can compress the enterprise part down to a very short part as short time as well for real products and we have to be like simple products products that are simple enough can be too complicated for that kind of time frame but yeah right anyway uh, cool well very cool um, uh, you know one aspect of this that you asked about you know how do you accelerate things and yeah. and I think that that a part of this is the how do you how do you partner how do you design products to that that they can be as much as possible can be manufactured locally but partner with existing capacity that uh, that already exists around you like you know it's great if I can manufacture my own thing but if there's a guy down the street who's got a, a, a CNC router and he's got surplus capacity and I can tap into that capacity easily, mm. well then, you know, it, what I should be developing is the ability to, you know, get a design to him that he can understand and act on and then route that material to the next guy in the supply chain who can anodize it. And he can route it to the next guy who can, you know, perform the next operation. So, you know, it, the stuff that has to be truly custom, I can do, and but I can take advantage of, of existing capacity without reinventing that wheel. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it, it, if, if that existed, you could go very, very fast, um, you know, because you're, you're, you're only going to know as much as you know, and, you know, you're going to get tripped up on these little bitty things that, you know, that, that hyper, that the difference between knowing how to do something and being experienced with it makes all the difference in terms of going fast. That the guy with the experience is actually going to outperform, um, you know, the system. He's, he's going to know how to set up a job to, you know, minimize tool changes or to, and, uh, and, and if you're talking about the marketing part, somebody who already knows how to access that marketing uh, capacity is going to go faster than than uh, uh, a bunch of amateurs. Yeah, absolutely. And that well, that's the whole idea behind the the extreme. We call it the extreme enterprise event. You have to get those people. They don't have to be superstars. They have to be very competent, though. So that yeah. idea there was yes fill those, populate those roles very carefully with people who have the skill set, namely the experience, 
Yeah, because it can't be people just trying to learn that and during that event. It's, it's going to have to be the people that know how to do that already. Right. And they're attracted, hopefully, because there's all these other people that are uh, good performers that are invited to this already. So that's, that's kind of the, the idea here uh, to be tested, yeah. Sounds interesting, yeah. Hmm. Right. So in terms of this part here, you yep. uh, you want me to go ahead, um, manufacture a couple of these, and send them to you? Yeah, yes. Okay. I just need one to know that that it's the right piece. You're not making a hundred that aren't fitting. Um, and then yeah, I mean, let's go with it. So, so I'm still a little unclear. So as far as the estimate, like, can we say, can we fix that price, or or are you saying you can run into overruns? What did you want that tapped, or did you want it drilled to be tapped later? Uh, tapped. Okay. Yeah. Then, I, then yeah, let's let, we'll fix that price and. Because uh, you, because well, you sent me the two prices, one that's tapped and one that's untapped. Yeah, they were both in there. Yeah. I'm looking for the. Uh, uh, Four seventy-five per unit tap, drilled and tapped. Yeah, yep. Yeah, that can work. So, uh, you're okay. You're okay to fix that. So, yeah, I'm okay to fix that. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah, um, that's great. So let's let's do it. And um, yeah, if you could just send me the first sample, I just want to make sure that it's the right thing. That you didn't reverse okay. it for some reason, or or that my drawing is right in there, or whatever. No, I mean I've built a bunch of these, but uh, I've just been doing them on a drill press. That's it. Okay. So and it okay. it's not accurate. It's I haven't been doing it accurately, so I just want to get a little a little better consistency. But if I know okay. you can make one, I I'm, I trust you can probably make more. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'll uh, I'll work out either this weekend or early next week, um, and and if you'll send me an address to send it to, I'll get it out. Excellent. Yeah, it'll be great. Yeah, and good job. Yeah. Thanks for doing the path workbench, man. That's gonna be. I mean, clearly that's gonna take over the marketplace because it's gonna everyone's gonna have access to it. So. You know, I, I hope so. Um, you know, I, I don't like I said. I don't expect it to happen fast. Yeah. But you know, it's a. Uh, Time's on our side. Yeah. Know. Well, I mean, oh. and as far as the uptake of FreeCAD, it seems like it's pretty much starting to explode, wouldn't you say? Something has happened in the last year. Um, we, we've set records on several occasions for the number of people online at any one time. Yeah. The traffic has gone through the roof. The, yeah. you know, it, it's, something's got to change because it's not, it's not sustainable. It's, hmm. it's, it's becoming a very hard project to manage. So hmm. Hmm. we've got challenges there. Yeah, yeah. Do you know any of the names of the schools in Europe that you said are actually using FreeCAD? Because I want to look that up, um, see what they're doing. I don't. We okay. had one developer that was participating for a while that was one of the instructors, and it was, hmm. it was a technical school. Uh, I looked it up. It was south of Heidelberg. Uh, is in the in the south southwest part of the country, um, and then he passed away. And uh, we heard briefly from his replacement, who said he was continuing the work, but he's his replacement never stayed involved with the project. So I I, I don't even have a name of a school to point you to. Yeah. Yeah. I can ask around. No, that's good. That's what needs to happen. I mean, we're teaching. We're actually teaching FreeCAD. I mean, so we run these steam camps. And we teach FreeCAD, so I could definitely see that expanding to, okay, now technical schools will be interested in that and stuff like that. So I actually want to push that out to technical schools and regular schools. Yeah. So what do you use the curriculum for your your classes? Well, I mean, so we 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 drew it up. You want to take a look? And let me send you a link for what we've. Uh, have you have you seen the Steam Camp or? I have not. Okay, so let me just send you a link to what it looks like.
Yeah, so if you see the chat, that's the last camp we ran before COVID hit. Um, that was in March. But yeah, FreeCAD, I mean, we use that. That's our... That's all we do. I mean, right now well, I can teach somebody in like one hour to do to take FreeCAD and design their part for 3D printing. I mean... Okay. That's it's awesome. Well, the, the, the book that I wrote... The, the, actually, the second book that I wrote on FreeCAD mm -hmm. uh, was partly designed to be used for, you know, I wrote it with that in mind, oh. as it could be used for curriculum, at least at the high school, middle school, trade school level. Um, the uh, It's only ebook at this point, um, but if there was a, a reason to have print versions available, um, that, that's something that could be done. We could do print on demand for uh, if there's print books desired. So. Hmm. Well, that might be. Um, so we thought about this concept of, um, you know, the open source everything store, where we basically take open source products and feature everybody's uh, uh, qualified. I mean, people who are open source, open source products on a common marketing site for that's open source, free and open source centric. Uh, maybe yeah, maybe we can take that topic up in the future, like as far as cross-promoting products. Because basically, what we want to do is, okay, let's have a site where you know you're getting like open source, and not only that, but what we're promoting is the idea of distributive enterprise, meaning that if you want to take this open source product, we'll teach you how to do that. Like for example, we teach people how to build our 3D printers, the ones that we sell. So it's we call that distributive enterprise, but we want to get a website up that's specifically for the distributive enterprise concept that we're actually okay. distributing the wealth um, and there's a whole service around that and all that so that's that's the kind of model we're using we're teaching people and making all our stuff well, open source that fits in partly with the uh, uh, one of the business models that uh, uh, Jean-Marie was looking at for uh, just your dot parts was the idea that you you could publish designs on the site and people ah. could purchase directly like a store oh. and part of that would fund free cat or would fund another nice. organization okay so okay, you'd be able it. to incorporate the models directly into your assembly and nice. be able to source them directly through this the site that is awesome that's awesome well i could see uh definite uh, potential there also uh, i talked to a couple of the fab are you in touch with the fab lab guys at all or no, not really. Yeah, I just uh, spoke to them and they had a presentation on machines. But um, yeah, they have a couple of guys there that are working on open source equipment. So that would be really cool to see. Okay, now we're getting towards the open source micro factory. Here's the open source FreeCAD, a storefront where you can actually get the parts that are supported in FreeCAD. That's an ecology happening right there. Yeah. Absolutely. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. No, that's I want to see that. That's that's kind of the deal we were we're working on the whole getting the whole open source microfactory up to the point where you have an induction furnace and we're doing our virgin steel from scrap in a small facility that's ten thousand square feet or less and that can be distributed anywhere in the world. Yeah, right. that's that's the idea. Very cool. So, okay. Yeah. Yep, yep. All right. Let me work awesome. on this and I'll be uh, I'll be back in touch. Okay. Well, thanks, Brad, for your time and this is great. You bet. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.